right, so what is growing on? Little nursery update for here this morning. And actually this is a little bit of responses to some emails and questions we've gotten just in the last week or two. Um, you know, this time of year, a lot of things are going dormant. A lot of things are going to sleep, um, especially like our stone fruits, our mulberries, um, turmeric, things like that. And I've gotten people sending us pictures of these plants, you know, with spots on the leaves, whether they be yellow, whether they be brown. Um, and that's very, very common this time of year. I mean, I could strip those leaves off to you and send them bare leaf and you wouldn't see any of that, or I'm gonna ship them to you with the leaves on them the way they are, and they're gonna end up falling off anyways. So probably gonna be taking the turmeric off of the shipping list within the next month, just because I'd be selling you a pot with dirt in it. And that entire plant goes to sleep. Typically speaking, you wanna have that plant at least in the ground for a year solid um, before you dig it up. You wanna let that leaf completely go to sleep um, put all that energy back into the root. So I'm gonna kind of show you guys what's going on around here, what we have in the nursery, lots of lemongrass, lots of sugarcane, lots of vetiver. Um, the muley grass is flowering this time of year, looking really nice. Simpson stopper, um, our native firebush. We've even got a lot of flowers on the rosemary. This one really caught my eye this morning. Um, this is the cat whiskers, really pretty one, puts off a nice flower, acts as a nice small bush in the landscape also. Usually there's butterflies out here, bees out here. It's a little bit cooler out this morning, a little windy, a little overcast. They're not out to play yet, but it's a really looking, you know, pretty looking plant in the landscape. Um, lots of elderberry, no flowers on these because they do get pruned regularly just to keep them at a nice height so they fit in a box for shipping purposes. But you can see even at a small size, the sweet almond is already putting off some nice flowers. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to put it out there about the turmeric, about the mulberries, about anything that's going to be losing its leaves this time of year. Um, they're going to get spots on them. They're going to have brown spots. They're going to have yellow spots. I have you know, all these emails in my inbox right now and people asking me if it's this kind of fungus or this type of issue. And it's just because the leaf is getting towards the end of its year, the end of its life, and it's getting ready to fall off of there anyway. So, you know, that's when like I, I drive around the farm right now, all of my mulberries are dropping their leaves. And they're just, they start to look really ratty before they fall off of there. They get spots on there, um, whether they be yellow, whether they be, be brown. They're very, very common for this time of year. Um, you can definitely still plant a plant like that that goes dormant this time of year. Um, but just know it's not going to look its, you know, its height. It's not going to look as, as good as it could look in spring when it's pushing out fresh new leaves. And it's really, really pretty. Um, nice looking growth for, you know, six to nine months. But you know, towards the end of that nine months is when they start looking a little bit of rough, you know, like now when we're getting into that October time. So let's kind of look around here, talk a little bit what's growing on. We are adding some new Japotacabas really soon. I got a bunch of new stuff in. Um, I guess I could show you guys over here real quick. Figs are fruiting. Whoa. You know, it's another one losing its leaves this time of year. Um, you know, nice new growth on this little leaf, but these older leaves are really brown spotted. Um, I was going to show you the calyx real quick though on the roselle. This is a, uh, a favorite for us, a very popular one. Um, we move a lot of these and you, can, you know, this is what they make the zinger tea out of. Um, you know, typically this would be dehydrated, steeped into a tea. We sweeten it with a little bit of stevia. You don't even need to sweeten it. Very, very high in vitamin C. And if you were to like to go Publix or something like that, you know, this is what they would call that um, hibiscus tea. So has a little bit of a spicy to it, a little bit of a crunch to it, a little bit of a, a sweet to it. And I shouldn't say spicy, but more of a tangy. Um, so it is a little bit on the tangy side, but it's good. It's in a good way kind of tangy. So mm. that's another one that gets some spots on it this time of year. The longevity spinach. You know, we can get some dark spots on the leaves. A lot of times that's happening after my first cold front. And you can see we get some holes in the leaves. Um, you know, we don't spray this stuff with anything. So, you know, if you get one of these plants and they have a few spots on them, um, whether they be yellow, whether they be brown, you can just rip that leaf off of there. You can cut that plant back. It's going to grow back. Um, it's actually going to promote some new growth. So don't, you know, just know that we're not spraying chemicals on there to keep every insect, every bug off. You might get a couple little spots. A lot of those spots are actually caused by my overhead irrigation. We try to move the product fast enough to where they don't get the spots on there. Sometimes it doesn't always work out like that. But you can really see a lot of the um, turmerics in this area kind of starting to go dormant, getting a little bit brown in the leaves. What I will probably do is ship you guys roots in the winter time like we did last year and just not the whole plant. So you're not going to get that big flag on there. I'm not going to just send you a pot of dirt because I want to keep the weight down. So. If we are selling turmeric here in the uh, the wintertime, it's gonna be the root only. Uh, 
edible leaf hibiscus really looking good right now. No spots on these guys, but you know, we might get a couple of holes in the leaves. Um, no big deal. These are probably a little bit on the too big for shipping. These are probably more available for shipping. There's four inch, those are definitely going out for shipping. Um, and just so you guys know, that is one you want to protect. Um, in the wintertime, I actually just got an email from a client in Georgia that bought it. Said her plant's like four foot tall. She asked me about starting cuttings. Um, you can do cuttings from that one. Um, the Togan spinach, the edible leaf hibiscus, any of those ones, they just, they don't take very easily. Even with a rooting hormone, we need to get 25% to take. So a lot of times I am bu even buying those in from some of these big tissue culture companies because they're so good at it on a larger scale. Um, and I know I'm getting a tray of rooted cuttings and you know I don't have a 75% failure. So time is money and when you're busy, um, you know a lot of times you, know, you, you just have to do what works best, what's quicker. Uh, lots of chaya, I get a lot of people asking about the difference in the chaya. Do we have a sting, stinging chaya? Um, I find the smaller leaf one is really good for the beneficial and the predatory insects. Puts out flowers way, way, way more often. Um, where the bigger one is probably better for eating or cooking um, purposes. You know, it does also flower, just doesn't flower as much, but it makes a much bigger leaf. Um, so, you know, you get a lot more product there when you're actually using it and harvesting it. Looks like I have a, a big pine tree that broke off. I didn't even notice that until now. Hoping most of it went over the fence. Um, the girls didn't tell me about that. And this is the time of year where the pine needles are falling. That's something eventually I'd like to get out of here just to keep the mess in the nursery a little bit easier to control. We do have lots of new bananas on the website right now. Check it out. I did just get a couple of trays in a few weeks ago. And look at the size of this thing. I mean, you guys can turn this right into a wrap. Super nutritious. I think I read four times more nutritious um, than regular spinach. So this is that Togan spinach. This is the large leaf. This is one of the skinny leaf varieties. We've got a couple of different varieties of that. Uh, lots of purple possum passion fruit. That is an edible variety. And guys, that's another one. I always get questions about passion fruit. You know, there's like, I think thousands of varieties of passion fruit. And there's like maybe, to my knowledge, 20, 50 edible varieties. So you really want to know where your passion fruit's coming from if you want to get fruit off of it. The most common ones are a lot of these purple and red varieties. There are some yellow varieties. There's the giant granadilla. I personally think that like the purple possum, um, the bounty, some of these purple varieties are probably the best. They're also the sweetest. Um, you know, that's something that we always get spots on in the nursery. It's very hard for us to, to stop it. Those are very hard to, to put on drip irrigation when they're in four inch pots. And it's just the nature of the beast with the way that we're growing these things. But the bananas do get some spots on the leaves too. You guys have to look at these small bananas as a seed. Um, you know, do know that you're going to get another banana by planting this banana. This is the first baby. And these are tissue cultures. I've talked about this in many of my videos before, and I find a tissue culture to be a weaker banana. Um, to where a pup is definitely a stronger banana, but pups are so big, they require so much soil, they're very hard to ship. Um, where this will work just great to get you started, this is your baby, and then the next one that's gonna come up tends to be a stronger banana, healthier banana, bigger banana. So they can fruit this original banana from the tissue culture, but know that that, that baby that they put off um, you know, it's going to be a bigger, stronger plant. And, you know, after that banana fruits, that tree is going to die back and you're constantly going to have babies coming up and taking their place. So, you know, they're constantly regenerating like that. I'm seeing lots of groomy chama. Thinks I see a bunch of Patanga tubas, lots of cherry of the Rio Grande, lots of sisu spinach. That one's been flying off the door. Um, lots of katuk, lots of butterfly pea. I really owe you guys a video on the butterfly pea. I want to make the tea with it. Um, really really beautiful flower makes like a kool-aid like drink I see lots of rue um what do we got growing on over here lots of yarrow lots of these strawberry plants strawberry trees the yellow ones um seem to do a little better for us we have some red ones also here's a bunch more small bananas a lot of our four inch perennial peanut um you know look at this guys in a one gallon you know these star fruits are putting out flowers and you know I talk a lot about letting a tree get to a large enough size to be able to hold fruit um, to be able to sustain that fruit you know a lot of times with a young avocado it can stress it out fruiting at a young age well that's not an issue with the star fruit you guys don't have to wait for the star fruit to get bigger to let it fruit I have these guys fruiting in pots um, nothing seems to stress them out other than wind or maybe too much sun they definitely find they like dappled light um, and they like a really wind protected area, um, but they can fruit at a young age and it doesn't stress them out. You almost want to slow those things down. They're super, super overachievers. 
Um, so lots of African potato mint, other mints, other herbs in this aisle. Um, what do we got here? Lots of rosemary. Um, oh, there's that edible tibuccina putting out some beautiful flowers on it. Pretty awesome looking. Um, lots of cherry, the Rio Grande's, lots of Suriname cherries throughout here. And nursery is pumping. The girls are doing an awesome job out here. And everything pretty much over on this side, other than a couple of these back rows, is for our online store and shipping. And yesterday was shipping day. My goal was to get out here yesterday morning and get you guys a video, get some action in the, in the house, but it was pouring. Um, I had a new project we were starting yesterday. I had to get out the door a little bit earlier than I expected. So I didn't get out here yesterday while they were actually in the action. But uh, I know I've had so many questions on emails. I knew I needed to get back out here and just kind of talk about some things, talk about what things are going to look like this time of year, talk about what to expect. And, you know, just know with the ultra tropical stuff, you know, some of those things you might want to keep in a container just so you could bring inside and protect if you are in an area that's susceptible to freeze. And when I talk about things that are sensitive, I mean like the strawberry trees or the bananas or Barbados cherry, you know, those are slightly sensitive if you're in a zone you know, that's 9B or north, um, you know, so unless you're in zone 10, you know, you definitely want to just keep in mind that you might have to protect that one throughout the winter time, put it in in spring, but it's going to require a little bit more water in spring because we're so dry, we're so hot, you know, it's our drought time of year, um, you know, we plant almost all year long down here in Florida, other than like our ultra tropicals, so I just did a uh, food forest follow-up video, we planted a cercopia here on the farm, um, that's something I probably should have waited till spring to put in. I was impatient, wanted to get out of the nursery. It was big, but those ultra tropicals that you're pushing the edge with, you might want to just baby a little bit longer, pot them up, you know, go from that four inch to a one gallon, go from that one gallon to a three gallon, you know, give it maybe a little protection through the winter after February, after our last frost, that's when those can go out and get in the ground. Um, really, really cool here. Mulberries, you know, just by pruning them back, they actually set off another fruit you can see they're starting to flower here in a couple of different cases. Uh, lots of Keenoff hibiscus. This is a really pretty flower. This one's doing really good this time of year. Oh. These have edible leaves and flowers. Ooh. All right, action around here today. Uh, lots of cranberry hibiscus, Turk's cap hibiscus, Okinawan spinach again. So a lot of uh, multiples from what you saw over there on the other side, kind of stepping in a row. Um, we've got natal plum, we've got porterweed, we've got vitex, we've got uh, a couple different varieties of grafted um, avocados in one gallons, we've got papayas, um, a lot of those different celosias and um, dragon's breath, different spinaches down there on the far left, some different caliandras here. Caliandras are ultra cold hardy. I've planted these all the way up to Ocala. They've made it through the winter time. Same thing with the Phytex, ultra cold hardy. Same thing with the Sweet Hamond, ultra cold hardy. So a lot of these we don't have to worry about at all. Um, cassava, you know, cassava is one that definitely goes dormant here in the winter time. We're probably gonna stop shipping here within the next few weeks and it'll come up again in the spring. So if you don't see cassava, just know cassava is coming, hold tight. We're doing everything we can to secure a lot of these new varieties and having them available for you again in spring. Um, you know, even if things do take a, a hit in the cold, you know, most things do come back. And papaya could be a little bit tougher, but the Mexican sunflower, you know, the tithonia, well, that'll freeze to the ground and recover and come back for you. Um, especially if it's, you know, got any kind of roots established out, it really does well. You know, I've had it freeze to the ground almost every year here, um, other than the ones in semi-protected areas, and they come back. You can see the Molokia is getting towards the end of its life. And this is a, a favorite for us, you know, in the, um, in the summertime. It's a really nice perennial green. Makes these beautiful green seeds inside of these pods. Um, I like the flavor of the leaf on this one raw. Um, and one pod, you'll probably get like one or 200 seeds from. So you save these, you let it dry out a little bit more before you actually pick it. So this is early. Um, and you know, you save the season, you can replant them again in spring. What I've seen done and what I like to do are actually take these pods and pickle them and almost eat them like an okra. They're absolutely deli delicious pickled. So Molokia, um, Egyptian spinach is a great one to add to the food forest, perennial garden type area. We've got lots of these um, six street mulberries coming up guys. This is the most nematode resistant mulberry. Um, a couple of these, you know, Big time fruit collectors, growers here in Florida have been doing a lot of testing with these. They did a nematode kind of 
trial with all different varieties and they found that sixth street was probably one of the most resistant to nematodes so our goal is to start grafting a lot of these different mulberries these ones that are harder to start from cuttings and actually start putting them out there and selling them on a you know more nematode resistant rootstock so you don't get a crash in a couple years because they can be affected by the nematodes lots of things can figs can be affected mulberries can be affected papayas can be affected i even heard bananas can be affected so just kind of keep that in mind Lots of uh, gondules, the, um, the pigeon pea over here in this area. What do we got here? We've got some ice cream beans, some inga, uh, Malabar spinach kind of getting towards the end of its life. More little rosemaries, a couple of figs kind of hanging on what's left. And you know, as figs are gonna get really ugly this time of year, if you get them and they have no leaves on them, or if you get them and the leaves look like this, you know, peel the leaves off, no big deal. Let them go to sleep. Springtime, they're gonna flush out with some new growth and look really great again. Lots of stevia, which is actually flowering this time of year. Um, it doesn't go dormant in the wintertime, but it does set some flowers. And starting to see some of those butterflies showing up. Looks like that's just a yellow sulfur. Oh, there's a gulf fertility maybe. And you can see them up here dancing on the chaya. I think we've got three or four different varieties of chaya, guys. And you know, that is like a chaya tree. Um, these can get quite big and you know I've done videos kind of talking about how tough this tree is and I have to come through here and prune this all the time I usually just throw the excess under the tree and the excess will lay here for months at a time with growth on it I mean these are the type of trees that you know we need to be growing for food security survival foods I mean these are like just unbelievable tough guys look at this look at this I mean that thing is just laying there and it is still green, it is still alive. Let me pull this one up because the other one did root into the ground a little bit. So this one has no roots on it. It's probably been laying here for who knows how long and there's still like little new growth pushing on this, still green leaves on this. So super, super tough plant. You know, if someone was to ask me like what are the best, easiest to grow survival foods, you know, to plant, I would say chaya, moringa longevity spinach you know these guys are all really 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 tough um, for the most part you know moringa can get a little bit of cold damage in the winter time but it comes back from the roots every year as i'm talking i'm noticing some Suriname cherries over here kind of an offset we've these do set a couple times a year but it's not too common here for late fall so got a little bit of a freak flower on that one what do we got some more sweet almonds some world's best mulberry that's Bryce's. Um, here's a lot of the uh, Everglades tomato. This is the one that wants to thrive down here. Will grow into a patch, does really, really well. Um, lots of Everbearing, Red's Turk's Cap, Mexican Sunflower, and a lot of the things we already talked about. Elderberry, Nopales, still got some of the variegated Nopales hanging on. And the nursery is just pumping, so guys we are going into fall and i just wanted to give you a little bit of an update just let you know you know what plants can start looking like what to expect if you order you know why this might look like that and just trying to answer some of the questions that i get in emails i am going to start working on more plant specific videos here again soon just getting into those individual plants short videos where to plant them how to grow them what to feed them how to prune them had a lot of requests for that not normally something I have a lot of time for, but I'm gonna to try to make time for you guys and start breaking them down like I did years ago, where I went into that individual plant instead of just kind of doing a run through here and naming 50, 75 plants. I know it can get a little bit confusing, but wanted to make this quick video just to address some of those email questions. So thank you guys for the support. Just so you know, all plants go out Monday and Tuesday around here. So if you're on the West Coast, typically we're shipping on Monday, they're there by Friday. Um, so thank you guys for the support. Most importantly, subscribe to the channel. Be sure to hit that bell to stay notified and pound some dirt.